Hi, this is Steve Siebold from the Bone Allen Mansion here outside of Atlanta. And I'm with one of the top leaders in World Financial Group today in our studio here. James Schwartz is from Dallas, Texas. I've known James for, for a number of years. He's one of my favorite leaders in the company, uh, one of the most honest people I've ever met in business period. And uh, James, welcome to the mansion. Hey, thank you very much. Glad to be here. Hey, I'm thanks excited. for coming. Yeah, great. Can you tell us how you got started, kind of a little bit about your background before WFG and then kind of how you got introduced to WFG and that type of thing and your, and your current rank, if you would, as well? Sure, yeah. Um, so I'm a CEO, MD with, uh, with World Financial Group, um, but uh, I'm from New England originally. I grew up in Maine. My dad was a lobster fisherman, and so my mom was a, a stay-at-home mom. And so I always used to say uh, that, you know, my mom was, uh, didn't, didn't do anything. I said, my mom didn't work, but then I realized as I had kids, my mom worked a lot. And so a uh, hardworking mom and a hardworking dad. And so, uh, but like most kids who grew up in a small town, I just wanted to get out of that small town as soon as possible. I, I in, uh, had big dreams, big goals. And so I joined the, U, uh, the U.S. Army and I went right out of high school. Uh, four days after uh, graduation, I, I was in boot camp, at Fort Knox, Kentucky, wow. run, running full tilt down Battalion Avenue. So, and uh, went to school at a, a military junior college uh, right after that. So I spent two years at a military junior college where you could get commissioned as a, an army officer. And so I was commissioned in 1997 uh, as a, a first, excuse me, a second lieutenant and just decided I needed to get my bachelor's degree and finish that up. So I, I finished up my bachelor's degree at Salem State University outside of Boston, Massachusetts. And uh, played basketball and baseball. Like similarly, you okay. played uh, pro sports. I didn't go that high, but I uh, played basketball and baseball, walked on on, on both of those. So um, just uh, always been a, you know, a, a person who wanted to go after it and, and, and get it done and, and, and work hard and make things happen. And so, you know, I, I spent uh, the next basically five or six years of my life in active duty uh, at Fort Hood uh, and uh, well, back and forth between uh, Aberdeen Proving Ground and Maryland and then Fort Hood. And I was a member of the 1st Cavalry Division. And so we went to, to uh, Iraq in 2000, uh, end of 2003 uh, through 2005. I spent a uh, better part of 15 months there. And just like most people, I think, you know, I, I was drifting in life a little bit, just didn't really know where I wanted to go. I had intentionally gone in the military, obviously, but I didn't really intend to stay there for as long as I did. And I found myself, you know, kind of drifting without a real aim, a real chief goal or chief purpose. And so I decided that I really needed to do something different. And my wife, uh, she snuck a book in my duffel bag called Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And I read that book and I really couldn't do anything about it because we were stuck in Iraq for 15 months. Sure. But when, when I got back... Uh, I told the general officer that I worked for that I was going to resign my commission and I was going to get out. And a lot of those guys, um, you know, at that point were just not happy. They said, look, why would you do that? You know, you've got 10 years in, you're a captain, get ready to get promoted to the major. You know, your life's going to be on easy street. 10 more years, you could retire. And I just didn't want to do that. I, I had something inside of me told me there was something else I needed to do. Was it because of the book? Yeah, it was. Yeah, it really, wow. honestly. Well, I had always been kind of an entrepreneurial mind. You know, my dad was a lobster fisherman, so he never really worked for anybody. And I knew that lifestyle. It was hard work, obviously, but he never was beholden to a boss uh, other than my mom. And so, uh, <laughs> so for, for that, he, uh, I, I loved that because he could take time and fish when he wanted to or spend time with us. And, and uh, that was big. So when I got back, I, I really decided, to, uh, you know, I need to do something different. I need to set a chief aim, like a real, a real goal. And um, I started doing real estate because I thought that's kind of the way, you know, where I wanted to go because the book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, lends itself to real estate, sure. obviously, with Kiyosaki. Uh, but a, a guy walks into my office one day and, and just says, hey, listen, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm selling alarms. Uh, and can I put alarms in your, in your uh, packets when you sell, you know, houses? Can I put like a little flyer in there? And I said, sure, no problem. And then he mentions to me um, that he has an opportunity that he wants me to look at. And I said, well, you know, I'm not really interested in an opportunity. I've got my own business here. I'm selling real estate. I own a Century 21, and things are going good. And, and this is about a year and a half out of the military, about maybe two years out of the military. And I just, you know, was not really interested. But he persisted. And you owned and the Century 21 I office? Did. I did. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so I persisted, and, or he persisted, and he said, you know, you're making a big mistake. Robert Kiyosaki says this is going to be the business of the 21st century. So uh, that, that name obviously struck a chord with me. And I said, well, where's your meeting at? So I went to the meeting and it wasn't, it wasn't a terribly good meeting, if I'm perfectly honest. Um, but I saw something there that I thought this, this requires a little more, uh, you know, more detective work. I need to find out and really do my, my homework and see if this is something I, that I really want to do. And as I started to think about the business and started to do a little research on the business, 
Um, I found good things and bad things. But my experience has always been, you know, you're going to get good things and bad things. You go, whatever you go looking for, you're going to find. And so for me, I just decided, you know, I'm going to give this thing a shot. So I went to a bigger meeting in Dallas, Texas. And uh, Darren Farrell, you know Darren. And so he sure. was there giving the meeting. And it really kind of just changed my mind on, on the way business was done. And it revolutionized my thinking. These people were thinking huge thoughts and big goals. And that's why I first heard about your book. And uh, he was quoting from, from the 177. And, and I just thought, these are some people I need to be around. These people are electric. These people are exciting. This is, and I, honestly, I thought maybe I was the only one, you know, in the sense that you read this book and, and you're out there going alone as an entrepreneur. And, and you don't really realize there's other people like you that want to win, that have a big heart, that want to poke a hole in the sky. But when you get around them and you get in a room full of them, it becomes infectious. And I just fell in love with what we did. And then when they started to tell me really what we did for families, that's what sold me. Um, you know, I, I, I'm all for making money and I want to make a lot of money. Don't get me wrong. But money doesn't buy, you know, more time with your kids and it doesn't buy, sure. uh, you know, time with loved ones or it doesn't buy a happy marriage. Um, but, uh, you know, I loved and fell in love with their mission, which was no family left behind because, you know, at, uh, at 22 years old, my dad passed away, died of a heart attack. Mm. And when he passed away, he, he didn't have any life insurance. He didn't have any investments. He didn't have any savings. So it was devastating not only to lose my dad and I'm the oldest, uh, not only lose my father, but also now, you know, we have to have this massive financial crunch. And so we had to sell just about everything that we owned. We had to move out of the house that we were in. And, and, uh, and I thought that was maybe a rare thing. I thought, you know, this, this must be something that we didn't prepare for. But as I got further into the business, I realized that's a lot, almost like 95% of Americans sure. that aren't prepared for these types of things. So I love that crusade, that mission. I fell in love with that. And so I just, I said, you know, I'm in. I mean, and I, I sold my Century 21 business and I went full time. Wow. Like right out of the gates. So you sold the business right away? Right away. I talked to my partner and said, hey, I'm out. I want, uh, you know, and he's like, what, what's going on? What are you doing? I said, look, I think I found what I'm really put here on this planet to do, um, which is uh, help people, inspire people, lead people, coach, teach, and mentor, those types of things. And I found I could do that here in this company. So you went full time? Right away. Day. I didn't even have a license when I told them that I was doing this. And so I had no means of making income. So I had to hurry up and get that license. Wow. I had to go get another office, hire another assistant. Uh, do all these things. And so, um, yeah, we, I mean, we really went for it. Wow. How long did it take you to become successful? Let's say successful being $75,000 a year. Uh, I, well, I made, uh, I made my first hundred thousand, uh, right around the 16 month mark. So 75,000, wow. maybe around, around, uh, 10, 12 months. That's fast. Yeah. You know, and, and unfortunately I wish that you could say that that would happen for other people, but what, what, um, what people don't really realize when they look at me and they say, Oh, wow, you got that really fast. And, and they, you know, they think maybe I can do the same thing, but what they forget is, you know, I had uh, all that leadership experience, uh, in, in college athletics. I had hard work, which built a lot of intestinal fortitude with, with my dad early on in life because fishing's no easy task. Yeah. And then, um, being 10 years in the military and, and then pouring, you know, millions of dollars into training and, and teaching and, and building up the person that I am. So I was kind of a ready made package to do this. So, you know, our system is very easy to, uh, to duplicate if you are used to running systems. And so coming out of the military, I just said, well, where's the manual? What do I have to do? Point me in the right direction and, and get out of the way. And so that's kind of what happened. Would you say that that was a secret to your, your success? Yeah, no doubt. I mean, the, the secret to my success has always been when people ask me, they want to know, is it some, some, some good sales techniques or some fancy words or, but the bottom line for me is it's work ethic. You know, I learned that early on from my father. Uh, that continued on when I walked on it in both uh, basketball and baseball in college. And then it continued in the military. I mean, um, you know, you can beat 99% of people in the world with, with uh, a work ethic. And my, my wife has this quote. It says, uh, you know, hard work beats talent when talent doesn't work hard. And uh, <laughs> sure, for yeah. me, I don't, you know, I don't have a lot of talent in a lot of things, but I sure can work hard. Sure, sure. Why WFG? There's so many opportunities someone like you could have taken advantage of. Why did mm -hmm. you choose WFG? You know, I think uh, it's a unique platform because you can take an average, ordinary person like myself, and they can do extraordinary things and get extraordinary results. You know, I, I can't play in the NBA. I don't know how to invent apps. I, I can't rap or sing. So I, I don't know what else I can do to go out and make a million dollars and make a million dollars a year. But it, WFG, what it does is it, it levels a playing field. It's a great equalizer. 
the system, if you run it, will generate the results that you wish. And it doesn't take an, an extraordinary person to do that. It just takes a persistent person with, with a real dream and a drive. So when I recognized that system and I saw like a, a if you will, a roadmap or a railway already laid down, a railroad tracks were already laid down in front of me. And, and then there was examples of success, of success everywhere I looked. Everywhere I looked, there were examples of success. And I thought, well, if they can do it, I can do it. And if they've got this system to run on, I just can run that system and get those same results. So that was, for me, was an easy, uh, an easy, uh, you know, no brainer. So that's what you did to succeed. You followed the system. I just followed the systems. I mean, I didn't do anything outside the ordinary. You know, I've always, I've always known if you want to be successful, just copy whatever the successful person is doing. Don't try to reinvent something yourself. And, and imitation, right? They, we're, we're not paid to, to, uh, to create here in WFG. We're paid to imitate. And, and in, in most societies, when you say, well, I'm just going to imitate this person, they look at that as a bad thing. And they say, well, why don't you just do something or create something on your own? Well, you don't need to. I mean, sure. you, you can just imitate. And that, that, again, goes back to the military background. The military background for me was, was there was no creation there. It was already done. You, want, you, do, you see somebody shoot a rifle, you imitate it. You see somebody fix something, you imitate it. You see how someone's supposed to shine your shoes, you imitate that. There's no you know, inventive sort of ways. And uh, the systems have proven and, uh, and powerful. And so you just run them and you're going to get the results. Hmm. Well, what's the downside of WFG? Well, there's a few, you know, um, you're going to have to sacrifice and be imbalanced if you really want to succeed here and make a lot of money, you know, and, and you really have to come to, to grips with who you are and what it is you want, because this, this business will expose your weaknesses. And if you don't operate from objective reality, which you and I have talked about several times, um, you can kid yourself into thinking that you're working harder than you actually are. And then the business won't deliver the results and you'll wind up blaming the business when it's not the business's fault. So if you really want to get the results that you desire and really once you figured out what your plan is and your passion is and your, and your purpose and you go out there and, and go after it, you, you've got to be willing to be imbalanced for a short period of time. Now, a short period of time may be 10 years, but over a lifespan, that's, that's a short period of time. But you will receive balance for the rest of your life if you're willing to do that. The alternative is you don't do that and you're imbalanced the rest of your life working for somebody else. So that's a downside, you know, because a lot of times people don't have the, the mental capacity or the toughness to, to go through that. They're, they're, not, they're not willing to go through that. The other downside, if you look at it this way, well, I don't look at it this way, but a lot of people do, is that you've got you've to put a lot of money and effort and time and energy of your own. Uh, the company has a system, but it's not like where they give you a job or they pay you a salary to get started, which, so you gotta, you know, you gotta take your foot off first base if you wanna steal second. And they, they really tell you straight out, if you wanna steal second, man, you, you gotta get going because we're not gonna, we're not gonna shove you off the base here. You know, you gotta do it yourself. So, you know, I would say the two biggest things are be willing to sacrifice some time and effort. And, uh, and, you, and you know, you gotta know if you're gonna be building a real deal business, it's gonna cost you some money to just get it started. You're gonna need to get some office space and some assistance and you're gonna have to, uh, you know, get some licenses. And, and in today's society, I think we're very uh, like a microwave generation. We want everything instantly. And also we don't take responsibility in our, in our communities anymore. So we want everybody else to pay for everything else for us to get all this free stuff or an opportunity to do something. You know, nobody is, you're not owed an opportunity here. You were born or you came to the richest country, the best country in the world, in my opinion. And so we're all on an equal playing field. So you got to go out there and get after it. What about the critics that say WFG, especially online, that say mm -hmm. WFG is a scam? How do you respond to those people? Well, I mean, first you got to take that from where it's coming from. You know, like I said earlier, if you go looking for something, you're going to find it. You know, I mean, it, you know, I did something one, one time with one of my uh, a group of my guys I was training, and I just typed in eyeglasses. I see you, you wear eyeglasses. And I said, eyeglasses scam. And uh, you know how many <laughs> things came up on the Internet about it, about how eyeglasses were a scam and it wasn't really real. It was the, it was the industry just telling you that you couldn't see properly, but if you just train your eyes better, it was a bunch yeah, of BS. Right. And so, um, but, but, uh, you know, I look at it this way, you know, Aegon is a, is a half a trillion dollar organization or thereabouts. They wouldn't spend the time, energy, effort, and money in our organization if it wasn't. First of all, we're fingerprinted, we're licensed, we're highly regulated, you know, we sponsor the U.S. Olympic luge team, for example. I, I doubt very seriously that the U.S. Olympics would be involved in an organization. You know, that's a scam. I mean, so I would take, take that, those types of criticisms, those types of things you find on the Internet. I would look at the source. You know, you always have to look at the source. 
And if it's a credible person that's telling you this, then maybe you've got an issue. But when you look at those, those, uh, those typing or things you, you see on the internet, um, half the time they, they don't spelling things correctly, they're complaining about something, and if you really direct it back to them, usually it's things that they didn't do on their own. They're mad because they didn't make any money. Well, sure, I mean, this, is not, this isn't a job, this is a business. And if you wanna build a business, you're gonna have to get out there and do some things. And if you're not willing to do those things, for example, talking to people about what you do, Right. If you don't speak to anybody about what you do, nobody's going to know what you do and you're never going to be able to make any money in this business. And so if that's going to bother you, then this probably isn't the place for you. And so when, when people tell me, well, I've read this, I basically bring it back to this. You know, each office is independently owned and operated. And so, uh, you know, yes, we represent the brand of World Financial Group, but, but World Financial Group is me. World Financial Group is, is uh, you know, Guillermo Haro. World Financial Group is uh, Eric Olson. World Financial Group is, you know, Steve Smith, right? You know, Joe Blow. It's whoever they are. And for me, I can just tell you that, you know, we're going to have everything I tell you is going to be ethical and honest, and we're going to have great dealings. If you, if you decide to work with me, great. If you don't, it's okay. I don't need them. They need me. That's really the case. Okay. Now, I'm, now WFG has courses in MLM or multi-level marketing, network marketing. Sure. How about the people that complain that, well, MLM is a pyramid scheme? Right. Well, you know, I think we're a little different than, than multi-level marketing because typically we don't own any products that we have to buy. Like, uh, you know, if you were going to do oils or coffee or, or um, you know, some vitamins or something like that, you know, there's no, um, you know, annual or renewal, uh, monthly renewal charges for something. You don't have a product that you're sitting in your garage, all those types of things. So we're a little different in that aspect. We're multi-tiered in our compensation, that's for sure. Um, but realistically, you know, I don't get paid unless I get someone licensed and trained and help them uh, help a family save money. And if that family saves money, then they get paid, then I get paid. Whereas I think in other multi-level marketing organizations, when you get somebody recruited, um, they get paid a portion of that uh, recruiting fee. And you can recruit a thousand people here. You won't get paid a dime. You've got to build a business by teaching them and getting them licensed and, and helping uh, clients. The other thing I would say is, you know, um, the way that we're paid is, is again, similar. But uh, I don't necessarily have an aversion to multi-level marketing or network marketing. The, the quote-unquote pyramid scheme, um, pyramid schemes have, have been illegal for, you know, decades there are no pyramid schemes. I mean, if you just take a look at the organizational charts of things, that's how the, where this is coming from. It's the shape that really bothers the people, right? Mm -hmm. And you say, all the, people, all the people at the top make all the money. Well, that's not necessarily true. I have people in my organization who are below me who make more money than I do. Uh, so that's not true. But that being said, if you take a look at the organizational chart of the U.S. military, well, that's a pyramid. If you take a look at the organizational chart of my church or your church, that's a pyramid. If you take a look at the organizational chart of the Girl Scouts, <laughs> you know, it's just the way that things are structured. How about your corporate job? How about where you work? I mean, you work somewhere, then you've got a, you know, you've got a, a, a manager, and then they have a department manager, and then they've got a, a director, and then there's a regional director, and then there's a president, a vice president, and then there's a president, and there's a CEO. I mean, it, it, uh, the structure, I guess, is what bothers people, but it's semantics when you talk about the words. We're, we're very different. You know, you can make money here, and this is a key, this is key. I should have brought this up in the beginning. You can make money here without recruiting a single soul. So the, in a definition of a pyramid scheme... But you have to be licensed, correct? Got to be licensed. And you can't make any money in WFG well, unless you're licensed? No, now you can. You We've can. got products that you can make money on, like uh, companies uh, where you can do wills or trusts. You can refer them over and, and, okay. and get that. You can refer on uh, certain types of property and casualty insurance. So it's like a referral fee? Referral fees. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you can make some money okay. uh, without being licensed. But the real money's made with a license, for sure. So... That being said, you don't have to recruit anybody here. If you want to just go out and build your own business with your own pen, by all means, you can do that. Which, in, in a typical multi-level network marketing business, uh, you're not, you can't make any money just by yourself you know, selling electricity or selling oils or, or, or you can't sell enough vitamins to, to, you know, to pay off your house. Right. That's for sure. You've got, to, you've got to recruit to make money. And here, the, we, have, we have hundreds of examples, thousands of examples of people that are making a lot of money with nobody on their team. Okay. Yeah. And, and you know this, this, this statistic as well as I do. About 80% of the people that join WFG actually leave in the first 12 months. Why is that? Why do people leave? So many, such a high percentage of people leave the company. 
Well, I think they're not prepared for, for what they're getting into. You know, people have been employees for, you know, decades. Being your own boss uh, is both good and bad. You know, it's great because you're in charge of yourself, but it's also not great because you're in charge of yourself. <laughs> so that's something that I think is, is a, an issue with most people is they just simply don't plan their days or schedule their time appropriately. They think, well, I've got all this time, you know, and I can go here now. I can go, I can get drop on my dry cleaning and I can go have lunch with my wife and, right. you know, I can do these things. But, but, you know, you've got to treat yourself like an employee sure. and you've got to be your own boss, so to speak. But the bigger reason I think is disappointment. You know, people, uh, when you're in, when you're in a position, uh, in a, in a job or, or any type of corporate environment, you don't really face disappointment on a daily basis. But when you face some sort of disappointment here where someone says, no, I'm not interested or no, thanks, you know, or I've got to work with somebody else. It's like devastating the people because people aren't used to hearing the word no. You know, most people in America, they don't tell somebody flat out no. What they do is they just say, oh, I'll get back with you or they avoid it because they don't like to say no or hurt someone's feelings. And uh, when someone comes into this business, if you don't prepare them properly, because they're going to hear some no's, this is sales. You know, this is a, this is a, a business where you're going to have to talk to some people and you're going to hear no's and a lot of them. And so I always say you're paid in direct proportion to the amount of disappointment that you can handle. The thing is, is most people can't handle a lot of disappointment. You know, I've built a lot of, of um, you know, the, I would say this. In the, in the Navy SEALs, sometimes they, they say that you build a rock inside of you because of all the hard things that you go through, right? Like a diamond is forged under pressure. And so they build this rock, and whenever bad things happen or, or things happen to them, they can go back and draw on that knowledge or go back to that well, and then they can say, well, I've been through something like this before. Or, Man, I've had this. I've been hungry longer than this, or you know, I've been hurt harder than this, or you know, it's been tougher than this before. And a lot of people don't have an instance or chances in today's society to build that rock. They just don't. They, uh, you know, we go from a society where everyone gets trophies, you know, and everyone's great, and everyone can be the president, which is, that's awesome. But unfortunately, we only have one president, and there's 450 million of us. So, um, you know, you've got to be able to handle some disappointment. And I think we've, been, we've done a disservice to our society by allowing uh, people to push that dis disappointment out of the way and in, in the efforts of trying to make everyone happy. But you're robbing that person of the ability to grow. You're robbing that person of the chance they have to build themselves into the, you know, the real person that they could be. And so you, the questions, you know, I was a long answer to it, but the question was why do people quit in the first 12 months? Number one, they don't schedule their time properly because they're, they're their own boss. But, but uh, more importantly, it's the disappointment factor. They just simply can't handle the disappointment. And so you've got to do a good job of preparing them. Hey, heads up, this is going to happen. And when that does happen and they come back and they say, oh, you know, head hanging low. Oh, I talked to two people and both of them said no. You say, great. That's what you're supposed to do. That's what, you know, that's what's supposed to happen. You know, you talk to 10 or, and you get two. So, you know, you've only got six more of those guys until you get somebody else, you know. <laughs> and so uh, that's kind of how I look at it. But unfortunately, not everyone else is built that way. And so the unique thing is we give everybody a jersey. And what I mean by that is everyone gets a uniform. They all get a chance to get in the game. But not everybody's going to like the game. You get tackled one time. Some people say, I don't want to play anymore. You know, you, you, hit, you get hit with a baseball and oh, it hurts. I don't want to play anymore. So I don't know if you're going to be able to win in this game or not, unless we put a jersey on you. There's never been a test devised, nor will there ever be a test devised that can measure the heart of a human being. So it's not my job to measure your heart and to say, oh, Steve's got it, you know, or he doesn't have it. It's my job to say, hey, here's a uniform. Here's the tools. Get out there. Get in the game. See if you like it. And if you don't like it, that's fine. No harm done. At the end of the 12 months, if you quit here, chances are we've given you some financial tools to help you in your personal life. We've helped you save some money probably. And we've done some personal and professional development with you. So you left here a better person. That's for sure. sure. At least that's my goal. Sure. Okay.